Do you want it like this? You, I'm sure you're it's familiar fine. with it, Zoom. You yeah, can... no, it's just nice for people to see the room and they can see me and I don't like to be front center. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> thank you for that. Of course. Oh, thank you. Oh, excuse me, I got the hiccups. Hmm. Well, so we go until three o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Right? As you wish. We have it down till four. We're yours until four. Oh. If we're done, if you. Oh, okay. So we can have a break and then do something else. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just wanting to know the parameters because I didn't look. <laughs> I feel like does that change? Let me you know, move the chair. You know forward. what? You're petite. I can just move it with you on it. Right? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. sure. So. <laughs> just kind of like levitating. <laughs> it's frustrating. Look like Amy. Or or so yeah, so or similar, to similar to Amy. Or snow lines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Roy. Um. So I think it was a hello. hello. Have I seen you before? I was online earlier, Gina. Oh, I did. Very bad at Zoom, so. Yeah. New York yeah. Queens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just come to Florida and meet everybody from New York. <laughs> well, if I lived in New York, I'd move to Florida, too. <laughs> um, so we'll see how we go with time. But um, I did want to... Lead a meditation, and I wanted to share this with you. But I also like to answer all of your questions. So traditionally, what we do after lunch, because we're still kind of digesting, is we I'll answer questions for maybe half an hour or something, and then I'll I don't know how long the meditation is going to last, but um, it's just a meditation. It's a very general meditation. It comes from Padampa Sangye. We were talking mm -hmm. about great lamas, and he was a contemporary of Milarepa, so he lived in the 11th century. So we're talking about how ancient this is. And it's a it's just it's it's a healing meditation, but it will mm -hmm. also is a Mahamudra meditation. A Mahamudra and it, it's just looking at nature of mind. Mm -hmm. And um and so we'll do that after we answer a few questions. But I just personally have found that it's very helpful to uh, stabilize my mind and to calm down my thoughts because it's a meditation that um, where you work with the five elements. And so it's it's healing to body and mind. So um, I, I always like to share some kind of meditation. So we'll do that. But um, Steve, you had some interesting questions. Do you want to ask your questions? Well, we're simply, what is the role of humor in Buddhism? Well, there's a big role of humor in Buddhism. We need more of it. Mm -hmm. That's all I would say is that, you know, when you are around Tibetan lamas, they laugh and tell jokes all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's great to tell jokes. I'm just not a very good person remembering jokes. I just told uh, Rebecca about Confucius said, he who leaves crackers in bed, or he could feel him coming. <laughs> <laughs> so if you didn't hear that, no. he who eats crackers on bed will wake up feeling crummy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, about 20 years ago, I bought a joke book so I could be a funnier teacher, but I can't remember jokes, <laughs> except a few. 
<laughs> but now I Nick Rebush. Things I remember my name, but not jokes. Yeah, no, I might remember that joke. That's pretty good. That's that's easy. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're really serious, you know. We're way too serious, and when we take on Buddhism, we become even more serious. And I have a friend who's, I mean, she was, she's another one of these second generation Buddhist kids. She's probably almost 50 now, but when I met her, she was 18. And her mom, um, anyway, her mom's a friend. And um, she ended up becoming a, a therapist. And she, she, she coined the phrase, there's a disease, you know, within all the Dharma centers, particularly at BMT centers, and it's SBS. And so we don't want to have SBS. It's serious Buddhist syndrome. And <laughs> we, get, we get too serious about it all. You know? And so it's it's really good to be light and humorous. And I think you can tell an enlightened being because they're funny. They're light. They're lighthearted. Very lighthearted. Yeah, yeah. They laugh a lot. Yeah, but yes, she always has a smile. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, he was always laughing. And the other thing Mama did that was so extraordinary is every single person he met, he would take their hands and look right into their eyes mm -hmm. and just let you know how special you were. And say thank you. And say thank you. Mm -hmm. And so thank you, dear. Thank you so much, dear. And he made everybody feel special mm -hmm. because everybody is special. Yeah. And that was, um, yeah, so even my dad. So that's an example of many people have done, made me feel very good and done th good things for me. So if I can be a better person by doing those good things I've received from people, such as looking them in the eyes and yeah. telling them thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. And that whole um, thing in India when they go namaste, with me, it's, it means something like I prostrate to the Buddha within you. you know? So... Yeah, and and I, it's nice when you go down the street and people look at you and say hi. You know, there's some cities where that doesn't happen. So yeah, yeah. I was being in London with that when I was there a few years ago, and my English friend said, "We don't do that here." Yeah. Oh, yeah. but that's what's nice in Shetland. People do look at each other and say hi. Yeah. Same thing in this Israel. Yeah, they don't say hi. No, yeah, no. they're afraid, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I was in South Africa once with the relics, and you, you shouldn't look anybody in the eye. Yeah. This was in Johannesburg. So, but. Culture is different. Yeah, but I say go ahead and do as much, as long as you're not going to get beat up, you know, be friendly. Yeah. Number two, that was a very interesting question. Yes. And the second part is, you know, how will Buddhism, Buddhism help us with the impending upcoming uh, uh, zombie apocalypse? Yeah. So his question is, how is Buddhism going to help us with the upcoming uh, zombie. zombie apocalypse? But the up, upcoming apocalypse. Apocalypse, zombie apocalypse. And you know, I've thought about this a lot. What? Yeah, I've thought about it a lot. How Buddhism is going to help? With with the imp impending doom that's going to happen when we run out of oil and the air is so bad we can't breathe and well you weren't thinking specifically of the zombies oh a zombie you mean zombies, you said yeah. zombies. oh that's a joke he's trying to get yeah. us to laugh really, really I thought he meant I thought see I'm the one who has got SBS I think you know California think about that well see to me that's so far out of my reality I can't even I didn't even think about zombies <laughs> I thought you meant. You know, I, when you said zombie, yeah. I yeah. <laughs> when you start to address zombies, I was wondering. Yeah, no, no. See, so he's trying, he's just pointing out my lack of like understanding. Yes. And you're an excellent teacher at the university. A professor gave uh, advertised a lecture coming up, uh, mathematics and zombies, and the, the class was just full. <laughs> all the all the kids just love to talk about zombies. So if you want to attract people. Some you're going to talk about zombies. Okay, yeah, because that's the thing on TV now, isn't it? Zombies and vampires, right? Yes. Yeah, I don't I watch that TV. Was about Fifteen years ago. Oh, that's, <laughs> oh, that's over. Now. That's over. The vampire. Well, what are people watching now on TV? The AI revolution. The, oh, oh. Yeah, I mean, everything's going to be artificial intelligence. And that's the new zombie apocalypse, in my opinion. Yeah, well, that's what he meant. I thought he meant, you know, that. It's like something I didn't really get it. So. But I, I'm I don't remember jokes. I don't get them either. So, 
especially yeah. in England, a lot of times, you know, people tell jokes, and I'm like, well, Jackie told us if so Jackie told us something funny about her mother, her mother was talking about her personality problem. How did you describe that, Jackie? Right <laughs> here? Right here? Yeah. You told that thing twice. The oh, mother used to tell her. said I had eye trouble? Yes. And my mother used to tell me I had eye trouble. I want this, I want that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that is a good one. Okay, any other questions about what we said or just drama in general? So yes. How are we going to handle the, the zombie apocalypse? Yeah. Yeah. With Bodhicitta. Yeah. We're going to yeah. love all the zombies mm -hmm. and run away as fast as we can. I don't know. There was that movie about the Night of the Living Dead, but that was a long, long, long That's time so ago. True. Yeah. That is. I think Anne has a question about food. No, she has a real question. Let's <laughs> move on. Well, it's okay. It was entertaining. No, no, but we don't have a lot of time, so. Um, yeah, I just, um, my understanding about lineage is that, um, you know, Sid Arthur's words and his practices were uh, copied down like 300 years after he was born. So how does... How does it be a lineage? Yeah. Well, this is what they say. Now, I can't guarantee any of this is true. But back then, people had amazing memories. And also, there were a lot of enlightened beings around who had like special qualities. And they remembered and they passed it on, I guess. It was all oral transmission. Yeah, it was all oral transmission. And what makes me believe this a little bit is when I have, like, for instance, my one of my teachers, Geshe Sopala, who was Lama Yeshi's teacher and Lama Zopa's teacher. He lived in Madison, Wisconsin. You know somebody from... Anyway. And um, he had, like, when I told you about the seven-year practice, seven years of teachings on the master program, he had all of those texts memorized mm -hmm. all of them because they memorized them mm -hmm. and when he would teach he would and the, his holiness is the same the dalai lama is the same when he would teach he would just he would teach in english because he had english but then he'd start quoting something from the kangir over here or dharma kitty said this or shanti davis said this you know and it was utterly amazing and so if somebody can do that in this time this contemporary times surely people could do it back then when when things were not nearly as degenerate as now so that's my only way of saying that but i can say that with fairly good um certainty that whenever they did start writing things down that that, that lineage is is pure you know you. yeah and i mean the, and there is the whole story of the mahayana teachings that because some people say Buddha never taught the Mahayana teachings because they didn't appear until 500 years later. And the story behind that is very interesting, but it's also, you have to have an open mind. But um, there's such a thing as Nagas. Have you heard of Nagas? Mm -hmm. Nagas are like water spirits. And the, the Nagas were around also listening to Buddha's teachings. Like they say in the Heart Sutra, you know, because all the people that were there listening, they were Gandharvas and you know different spirits listening, and so they took the Mah and so the you know India in that time wasn't quite ready for the Mahayana teachings, and so they kept them and preserved them in Nagaland, which I don't know where that is. It's a spirit world. They say it's you know whatever because there are other are are other worlds we can't see, and so Nagarjuna went to Nagaland and brought back all the Mahayana teachings, as well as the prayer wheel. The prayer wheels came at the same time as the, all the Mahayana teachings. And so that's another story. So whether or not it's something like mythical or like Immaculate Conception, or if it's real or whatever, I mean, I think that, that that's up to us to believe. But I think the point of the Buddhist teachings are, well, two things. One, that it... Whenever all that started, I believe it's been pure since then because I see how it works in the monasteries and I see how they memorize everything and teach it and they don't become teachers until they've realized it, you know, and they say that if a lineage is lost, they burn all the books. You know, if nobody's holding it in their mind, nobody's learned the books. And this is what's a little bit tricky about the 20th century is that are people really getting it? 
you know, is it this is my big concern about FBT is that we and and is that and in fact it doesn't really come from me. One of my teachers, one of those great meditators, Geshe Yushi Chopton, um, he said, you know, you've got all the books, you've got all the places, you've got all the teachers, but where are the realized students? If you want to have Dharma, you gotta have realized beings. And that's why I went into retreat. Because that's, you know, you gotta have the people who've got got it in their hearts, not just in their heads. And FPMT is very top heavy right now in all of its intellectual teachings. And I don't see a lot in terms of how you then integrate that, mm -hmm. but it's coming. I know it's coming and it will be coming, but they have to do it one step at a time. You have to have the books before you can do anything else. You know, so I'm not criticizing. I'm just observing, you know, and seeing that um, hopefully that will be something in the future because it takes a long time. I mean, in, in my lifetime, you know, I know of Geshe's, you know, first they become Geshe's and then they go live in the mountains in Dharamsala for 20 years meditating and then they become teachers. So you've been asking about teachers. That's an authentic teacher. You know? And we've been privileged to meet quite a few of them due to the kindness of Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa and His Holiness. Like His Holiness and Geshe Yeshe took into Italy to teach Lama Sankar Institute. You know? So where did that come from? There were only two points. I can't remember. Who asked? What was the question? Where were lineage. Lineage. I think somebody asked about lineage. Purity of lineage. Yeah. Well, that's the main. Oh, and the other part is, is that, um, so I believe in the purity of the lineage, but also I think the proof, like we say in, I don't know if it's English or America, the proof is in the pudding. You know, I mean, I think we get a little bit caught up too much about where to come from this or that or yet the other, but if you practice it and it changes your mind, well, that's good enough. You know, that's the main thing. But I think it does help to know that it comes from a pure source. I think it really helps a lot. You know, and when you see people calling themselves Buddhists and making up new things, don't go there. You know, and that's what's happening here in the West. We get this mix of Buddhism and you know Hinduism and New Age and shamanism and you know and and I I mean and, and I'm not putting that down completely because um, I mean I myself you know I also you know study yoga I think it's important to have yoga and I have friends who who have enhanced their capacity as teachers by going to Mexico and studying with Mexican shamans you know but they don't teach that they still teach Dharma. And they don't go around, you know, I'm a shaman now, you know, but it has helped them to access their inner wisdom because we are a bit more blocked than Tibetans are because of our childhood and intellectual training and all that stuff. So I'm not saying, I, I, I think it's wrong to be, you know, there's only one way, you know, that kind of one thing, that business. But at the same time, it's like we're, we're talking at lunch. It's really important to practice within the lineage that you've started with and and just take the practices you've been given and work with them for a few years. And, you know, I mean, I know people who started out in Tibetan Buddhism and it didn't work for them. And 10 years later, they said, I, sorry, like Annabelle, you know, Rob Priest. Girlfriend. So, you know, it happened sometimes. It didn't work for her. You know, Carmen wasn't there. So I would also say it's fair to say, you know, I've tried it for a while. It doesn't help me. I need to do something else. And maybe you'll come back to it. In fact, one of the things the Dalai Lama said was, you know, if you take on a practice, a tantric empowerment, and you do it for some time, it doesn't work for you. It's okay. Even if you've had a commitment, it's okay. If it's not working for you, you can put it aside and say, you know, maybe I'll get back to it sometime. But right now, it's not the right thing for me. And I think part of us with our serious Buddha syndrome, we're so afraid to do that because we've been told we're going to go to hell, you know. And that's another part of Tibetan Buddhism that I have a little bit of issue with, was, which is that when we read texts like Liberation of Palm of Your Hand that were written for monks a hundred years ago, they're heavy duty. You know, they're, they're, they're using fear to get them to practice. We don't need that. In fact, if, we're, if, if fear is used to motivate us, it turns us off. You know, so I think when you read these 
teaching, I mean, the long room's different itself, but when you read somebody's interpretation of it and it's a hundred years old and it's written for monks, and you can imagine what it's like to try to manage a monastery with 5,000 monks in it. It's got to be heavy duty and, and disciplinary and authoritarian. So you got 5,000 men and half of them are 20 years old with all their hormones raging and everything. So you've got to be heavy handed. But then you tell a middle-aged female from California to read that. It's like, this is awful. You know? So we, you know, so we do have to use our mama, yes, she would say, use your intelligence, you know. And I think it helps to go to the source rather than an interpretation, another somebody else's interpretation, unless it's somebody that you know personally that you can trust, like Geshe Yeshi Topton. Uh, gave teachings on the Bodhicharavatara for I don't know how many times at Ramasan Kappa Institute. And, you know, it was published in Italian and now, because they had a translator, now it's in English. Well, I would read that, you know. And even Shanti Deva itself, you know, there's a whole chapter on how, ter- you know, how horrible women are. You just have to understand that that's in a cultural context. It's, you know, a thousand years old, four monks. You know, and instead of being all turned off to it, just go, oh, right, right, that was in that context. It doesn't apply. Yeah. You know, and they're doing their best to catch up with the times. So that's another word of warning about reading, <laughs> especially ones from traditional teachers that, from traditional times. And like that. But on the other hand, you can get outrageous ones where people have, you know, gone to a few retreats and they start writing their own stuff. And, and that's totally <laughs> bogus too, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Rebecca. There's a really beautiful series that um, Tipton Chodron did yes. with, with His Holiness yes. that yes. is the Lam Rim, and, but they changed the order to make it more accessible to the Western yes. mind. I, I, I think that's a really that's nice a really to do, to it, Thank you very much. You've added a, good, a lot of good things today. Yes, that's a very good book. And I remember even, you know, 40 years ago, His Holiness saying, that we should start backwards. We should do the long run backwards. In the West, we should start with emptiness and end up with guru devotion instead of the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't understand guru devotion. Really. So one more question and then we'll do the meditation. Yes. So there's a lot of talk about compassion in Buddhism, right? My question is, how do you deal with people that will try to abuse their compassion, right? You know what Lama Yeshi said? I remember he goes, we would smash them. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, but Bodhis, being a Bodhisattva is not being a codependent and it's not letting people take advantage of you at all. Mm-hmm. And they, they talked, the Lama, Chogin Trumpa used to talk about grandmother compassion. We don't want grandmother compassion. And, you know, we have in our culture the tough love Sometimes you have to use tough love, but sometimes it can be very, very complicated, you know, to figure out how to deal with somebody, you know, with a situation. But we don't let people take advantage of us unless we can see that down the road, you know, that they will end up with some kind of beneficial outcome. You know, we don't want to be combative, you know. And uh, one of our, one of the holiness's favorite teachings and there are a few books with his commentary on it and um it's the eight verses for training the mind and it talks a lot about how you deal with adverse circumstances and seeing people with as as our teachers but at the same time we don't let them harm us and i think we have a we have a really hard time with that you know we tend to um especially in dharma centers we, because of our backgrounds, we don't have enough connection with our authentic <clears throat> self and our boundaries and what's healthy for us, what's not healthy for us, because we had to abandon that. I talked about that earlier to get what we needed as children. And so we end up overworking and not knowing this, I can't do this right now. You know, I and no need to say no. And one of the things that Gabor Mati talks about, he says, every week at the end of the week, think about things you did that maybe would have been better if you said no to, and why didn't you say no to them? And what are the consequences of the fact that you didn't say no? Because we want to please everybody. 
And we're told to be good Buddhists. We're good to people. So we go around pleasing everybody till we're completely burned out. Right? <laughs> uh, previous teacher, Geshe-la, Yeah. He was saying, but he was applying that in real life here in, in Costco. Yeah. Store, and he had an, an accident. He bumped his shopping cart on another woman's shopping, shopping cart. He apologized to her. And the husband was there. And the husband was very upset. And he wouldn't stop complaining. He apologized to the husband. And finally, he said that, I will bow down to my knees for you. And Did he shut up? And the, and the wife shut up the husband at that point. But that was his experience. Exactly. Finally. Yeah. Not, not easy sometimes. Yeah, no, it's not easy sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, so it takes a lot of skill to actually be fully compassionate and work at it. And um, Yeah, especially choosing our language. I think that um, there's another person I like a lot. Um, I think we talked about it when I was here before, Marshall Rosenberg, who's done all the um, nonviolent communication work. And mm -hmm. I think that in, as Dharma students, we get a lot of um, teachings on what to do with our mind, but not to do with what to do with our speech. And he, um, the way he teaches is he, instead of like, you did this and you did that, he, he says, just observe what happened and try to talk about how that made you feel because the way to um, work with a sticky situation is to encourage that other person to have empathy for you by showing empathy to them. And then that often cools the fire of anger and like that. You know? But it's a really big skill to be a compassionate communicator and not just you know, offer the victory to people just to keep the peace. And I think in the heat of a my understanding now of thought training is in the in a heated discussion, you do go, I bow down to you. You know, you will do whatever you can to stop the anger, mm -hmm. but don't sit on it because then that'll make you sick. If you can, if it depends on the kind of relationship you have, just a few days later, say, you know, the other day, can we talk about that? You know, and if they're willing to talk about it, then you know you have a good friend and you can talk about it and work it out. But if they're not willing to talk about it, then you know, well, this is somebody that I can be friends with, but they I can't really have a deep relationship with them. You know? And so then you treat them kindly and everything, and you just understand that, you know, your relationship with them is going to be on their terms. You know? And if you're willing to do that, that's fine. I mean, people do that in marriages even, but it's not healthy. And so it's important to choose relationships that nourish you. And if you're in a relationship that doesn't nourish you, ask yourself why. You know? So we don't need to have grandmother compassion. Occasionally we do. But what we want is honest communication. And I, I mean, I'm just guilty of it as anybody. So, okay, you guys want to do a little practice? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see if I can see that. Oh, yeah, you want something under your feet. Okay, you get cold and it's uncomfortable. It's okay. I bet it's Japanese. We went from 70 to 74, so I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, but still, it's much. We're going to sit for a while, so you want to be comfortable. Yeah. I remember when I did my first long retreat. Remember Claudio? Claudio told me it was a three month retreat, and he told me that I had to go. To the pillow maker in Dharamsala and get a cushion this thick. <laughs> he said, when you sit a long time, your legs get sore. So you the, and he was right. It was so helpful. That, and I just left it when I you know, was at Tushita for years. It's good to listen to your to your to the older students. You know, they can really when we take refuge, you take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. <laughs> <laughs> so let's do that. So first of all, um, Let's just, <clears throat> let's just become aware of our body and our breathing. And um, it's good to unbutton the top button of your trousers so you can let your um, 
your belly relax. Just follow our breathing. And become aware of the space around us, the room and beyond the room. Almost like you can feel with your whole body where we are. and bring our awareness to our spine and our pelvis and feel our pelvic bones on our cushions, on our chair, our legs and our feet. Our Let's pay attention to the relationship between our skull and our spine. And although we hold our spine straight, but we do our best not to have it tense. Especially the neck. And what helps sometimes is to feel the space at the back of the mouth, the upper palate, and feel that like it's opening up. So you feel all your sinuses opening. And we feel the back of the head, like through the opening in the mouth, we kind of connect with, from the inside, the place where the skull connects to the spine the top of the cervical vertebra. And just feel that opening up. And that's why we tuck our chin a little bit because it helps to open up that space so that the energy is free to flow from the brain to the spine and back again. And feel our eyebrows relaxing, our jaws relaxing. We feel our body expanding from the inside. And we feel like all the pores of our skin are opening. And that we breathe not only through our nose and to our lungs, but as we breathe in, good energy, good chi comes in through all of our pores and energizes all of our cells. And if we're paying attention to the inside of our bodies, feel it kind of lighten up, like there's light inside. 
like suddenly a light bulb was turned on in your head and your heart and your, your body. You feel that light shining. And then we can focus on the center of our chest, our heart chakra. And we think of people, remind ourselves of people that we love. It tends to warm our heart. So now when we're breathing in, we feel like we're breathing into the heart and energizing that sense of love. And as we breathe out, it follows that light out through our pores into the universe. And as that light goes out to the universe, it reminds us of our parents. And so we visualize our, imagine that our mother and father are here with us. My father on my right and my mother on my left. All my friends are around. And all the people in the universe are all around us. And not just the people, but the animals, the spirits. And if we can focus on that light, it helps us from not going to sleep. And focus on the breath coming in and out and feeling that energizing, particularly in the brain area. Because we've eaten a meal now, so it's harder to meditate on full tummy. So if you keep your mind a little bit in the upper part, it helps not to fall asleep. So we can pay attention to our ears and our eyes and while we're you can have this awareness in the background, kind of like when you're driving a car, you know, you do quite a few things at once. So even though we're focusing on the road, we still are aware of all the, you know, cars around us and the people in the car with us. So we may be focusing on our meditation, but we still keep awareness of our body and keep this breath kind of in the light to keep ourselves energized so we just don't get sleepy and dull. So then we remember, you know, why are we doing this? We're only just starting, but we're settling the ground, settling the space so that we can do a practice that will be a benefit to all sentient beings and will help us to become better human beings and more able to not only follow the path to enlightenment, but to be of greater service to all the beings we encounter. all species, all races, all realms. And it doesn't take much for us to recognize what we were talking about earlier, the dukkha, the dissatisfaction of being in this kind of a body. Although it brings us a lot of pleasure, I'm not saying that it's not all bad. We have wonderful lives, but it's just a bit limited. So with this wish to have limitless love, limitless compassion, limitless wisdom, with no being left out, we set our motivation to become enlightened for all sentient beings. But in order to attain enlightenment, we need a teacher and we need teachings. We need a guide to show us the way and we need people to help us. And so when we recognize the truth of suffering and hear about a path and want to follow that path, then the first thing we do is to engage in the practice. And this first step is called taking refuge. And we, we say we take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and the Guru. 
in order to attain enlightenment for all beings. So when we can do that experientially, we visualize the Buddha, who is inseparable with the Guru, so that if you want to visualize his holiness, or Tara, or Chinrezi. But something that represents the purity of the mind and also some being that has the aspect to really help you. So much like when you were three and you fell down, you went running to your mom or your dad or your nanny or your older sister or brother. This is what it's like when we take refuge. We realize that we're hurting, that we're, we need help. And so we run to the Buddha. And we say, please help me. And you can take time to think about what I need help with. I need help with this. I need help with that. Please help me. And think about it to yourself. So then with this feeling of the Buddhas in front of us, we're told that when we when we call the Buddhas, when we imagine the Buddhas and ask for their help, that they will come. So maybe we can imagine that the Dalai Lama is right here in the room with us right now. Lama Yeshi, Lama Zopa, all of our teachers, Geshe Shara, Rabina, everyone that's here. in the form of whatever your object of refuge is. Let's just make it Buddha to make it simple. Seated on the lotus and the sun and moon on the, um, the throne supported by the snow lines, if you, if you want to do all that. And we turn to Buddha for help. And please help me to be a better person to follow the pure path of enlightenment. For me, my individual path, most especially, you know, make me humble, make me open, make me wise, make me compassionate and loving and skillful in my path, in my journey. And please guide me on the most, on the best uh, journey with all the circumstances we need very quickly to attain enlightenment. And so we can take, Lama Yeshi taught us that actually taking refuge without words is the best way to take refuge. So we just know that the Buddha nature, the ultimate nature of mind that's alive in the Buddha is also alive in me. And as I have faith and take refuge in the Buddha, it's waking up my capacity to experience my own Buddha nature. And so then we just take a little while to stabilize this feeling, this confidence that the Buddhas are taking care of us. You don't have to worry about anything. I mean, time will be challenging times, but if we see it all as purification and understand it's karma ripening and knowing that everything changes, everything is impermanent, then we're safe. Because no matter what happens on the outside of the world, with our faith, in, 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 and after a while, it actually is our experience of our own Buddha nature, then these things are just, you know, like a big wind that comes and goes, but our houses are still here. The big emotional upset comes and goes, but my stability, my faith, my Buddha nature is still here. So in order to stabilize that, we just imagine now for a little while, breathing in and breathing in all the blessings of the Buddhas in the form of white light or rainbow light coming into the crown of our head and filling all my cells 
with energized wisdom and love and compassion. And as I exhale, I feel it becoming stabilized in me. And then after a few breaths, we can imagine it not only stabilizing in me, but then going out through my pores and touching all the people I know and all the beings in the world and bringing this experience of true relief and gentle kindness of inner peace to all beings. So we'll just do this for a little while. filling our bodies with this light that wakes us up and fills the room with love and kindness and wisdom. And then we just take a moment to look at the, the person inside that's talking, that's feeling, that's me. You know, I'm sitting here breathing this and I'm feeling blessings from the Buddha, bringing me comfort and peace. And even if it doesn't happen, just, just do it because over time it will begin to be more real. First we imagine it, but then it becomes real. So you're feeling in things like you can say to yourself, when I breathe in, I feel love. When I breathe out, I feel safe. And I share that with all sentient beings. If we can, while we're doing that, we just take a minute to notice that sense of self, the eye that's doing that. And if we turn our attention to the one that has the attention, I know this seems a bit strange, but if we look at the, ex instead of, you know, we're feeling this experience of visualizing the Buddha, visualizing sentient beings, then as we turn the attention around to look at the experiencer, and just rest in that awareness. So this is how we take refuge in the relative Buddha. And then we talked before about relative nature and the ultimate nature is when we look at the experiencer. So the experiencer begins to experience itself and then you can't find that experiencer. And so then you just rest in that open awareness and eventually that will become emptiness. Don't worry about it too much, but just do it.
So then that's just the beginning of the meditation. So just relax your attention for a little while, just to take a little break so you don't get too tired. So if you want to, you can look around the room or open your eyes or just, you know, you might not need to take a break, but sometimes it's good not to, you know, go too long. Because every meditation we do, we should take refuge and generate bodhicitta. So then we'll continue. And so we go back to visualizing the Buddha and or the His Holiness, whatever is your choice. And the actual meditation is with the five elements. So we start with the earth element. And we can imagine that from the um, from the Buddha, yellow lights are coming and penetrating into our body. And from the body, light rays go out from our heart and hook back the energy of the earth element. So we think about mountains and rocks and beach sand and um, you know concrete on the freeways and wherever there is earth you know canyons earth element and we're bringing this earth element into our bodies specifically into the navel chakra which is just below the navel so you focus on just filling that navel chakra up with the energy of the earth element And this helps to heal any um, illnesses that have to do with bones and muscles and ligaments. You just start breathing the earth element in and feeling, just having faith with that stabilizing the earth element in my body. And just do this for a little while. And again, if you feel sleepy, just bring the energy up into your eyes and your ears and your head. Because the earth element is there too. And feel the space around you where the yellow lights are coming from. Into all of our pores. And then we can think that as our earth element and our bones and our muscles and our teeth are healed, also our miserliness and pride are healed and transformed into the experience of equanimity. I'm not higher or lower, just respect for all creatures. And we feel for the blessings of all the Buddhas 
I have rejuvenated my earth element. And then we move to the water element, and this is focused at the heart chakra. And so then again, the blessings of the all the water element first comes into us, and the Buddha in front of us. So the water element is white, it's clear like water. And then from our heart, the light rays go out, white light rays go out and hook back all the water elements. So easy here, the ocean, the rain, the lakes, the rivers. And that fills up my heart chakra and heals my blood, my saliva, my urine, anything to do with water in the body, all the interstitial bits and pieces in ourselves, revitalizing, rejuvenating, rehydrating our bodies. So now we feel our bodies filled with white light. And we can also know that as the water element is being rebalanced in my body, my tendency towards hatred is being transformed into what we call the wisdom of the Dharma Dhatu. And we just have faith. What we intend with our intention and our bodhicitta motivation, what we imagine will be, will be so. And after um, water comes fire. So again, red light rays come from the Buddha, filling our body with red light. And then that light from the Buddha goes out through our pores and brings back all of the all this energy from the fire element, from all the volcanoes, from the sun, from all of our cooking stoves, from the energy that runs our cars, whatever the, all that fire energy in the world is coming back into us. And this time we focus on the throat chakra. And this is healing all of the imbalances we have with our, in, with our digestion. Too cold, too hot. And also our, our temperature, you know, some people are too hot, too cold. We just feel our whole body, we focus on the throat, but the whole body is full of this fire energy.
If you start to be sleepy or your mind wanders off, just bring it back, filling your body with red light. And this light also transforms our desire. Not all desire is bad, but the kind of desire that makes us obsessive. And this becomes discriminating wisdom so that we can discriminate between genuine uh, need and love with just attachment that's frivolous, not necessary. And then after fire is um, air, wind. So living here, you also have a lot of experience with wind. So this is a green color. So first the green light comes in from the Buddha and fills our whole body with green light. And then this goes out and hooks back all the um, proper wind energy so that um, our body's wind is uh, stabilized. And so, you know, anxiety is a wind, is a wind, so is depression. They're wind disorders. We either don't have enough wind or we have too much wind. When we get overexcited, when we think too much, when we can't think straight because our mind's too distracted. So this is calming the winds of our mind. So green light all through us. And now we're concentrating on the, the chakra at the root. At the base of our spine. And we feel this, all the imbalances of our wind from thinking too fast and moving too fast, multitasking too much, so that we can't sleep at night and things like that. This is all being calmed. We bring the energy right down to the root base of the spine. And feel the body full of green light. And this also helps to heal our, our jealousies and a lot of dissatisfaction we have. And they call it the, the transformation of that into the wisdom of accomplishment so that we can do things at the right pace, at the right time, without having so much ambition that we throw ourselves off track. And then finally, we move up to the crown chakra and we have the space element. And that is the color blue, like the blue sky, like the blue space. So then we just, I mean, there's space everywhere. There's space in this room. There's all the space outside. And this helps us to also be more calm and have more space in our minds so that we can Rather than reacting quickly to things, we can be relaxed and have spacious um, responses and not feel pressed to respond too soon. And so this blue light of purified space element comes into um, our bodies from the Buddha. And then goes out into the universe, filling us up with this calming, spacious awareness.
you know, all the lamas tell us that emptiness is like space. So we can focus on space. It helps us to dispel all of our thoughts and just focus on the mind itself. Like I said before, the experiencer, the thinker, the feeler, the meditator, not what we're meditating on, but where that's coming from. And see that instead of I as space. Feel that as space. So then we're open to so many possibilities because it's just space. It's not me anymore. And this purifies our ignorance, our minds especially, and we call it the mirror light wisdom. Because when we begin to experience the spacious nature of the mind, then everything that comes into the mind, whether it's a thought, a smell, a taste, a vision, is just seen like a reflection in the mirror of the mind. Because the mind is not the thought. The mind is not what we see or what we hear, what we, what we smell. The mind is just spacious, clear. And when we mean that it's clear, it means that it's like the mirror and that anything can appear in the mind. Our thoughts, our feelings, they're in the nature of clarity, which means they are just like a hallucination, like, like when you look in the mirror, you know that's not you, that's just something appearing in the mirror. So when we first find that spacious mind, and then everything we hear, touch, is just a reflection in that spacious mind. And that spacious mind is also has the quality of softness, kindness, of love. This is really our, our ultimate nature, our ultimate refuge, our goal. And it's here with us now. Anytime we, we can stop and just let go and feel our space. The mirror of mine. The open, big love, as Lama said it, called it. So when we can relax enough to just sit with the nature of mind, we can see that these five elements are also aspects of the nature of mind. Because when we're just in our pure mind, it's very grounded. It flows like water, Flow, water is flowing, you know, thoughts are flowing. And when we rest in the groundedness part of it, we can just watch the thoughts coming and going without losing the spacious part of it. So we have this grace, we have the earth, we have the water. And the fire is our capacity to be aware. So the mind also has awareness. That's the fire element of this very subtle mind. And of course the wind is how it comes and goes. So when the wind's moving fast, 
it's very hard to see the spacious nature of him. But when we can focus on its groundedness and calm the winds by focusing also on the root chakra, then we're able to see the spacious, flowing, generous quality of the mind. And so, when we just be with whatever's happening, we don't try to change anything, we don't try to do anything, we just watch the thoughts, watching that flow, watching that river flow. And from time to time, instead of uh, watching the river flow, we become the river, we become the watcher, and we rest in that space. It has the fire aspect of awareness. It's grounded in its natural ability to love. Then we can just end our meditation by thinking to ourselves, may all beings be healed, may all beings be loved, may all beings have the capacity to love and to heal, may all beings be able to listen, may we listen carefully to others. May all beings have their needs met. May they care for others and may they be cared for. And through the power of developing our minds, may we become examples of purity, love, care, wisdom, May we be of use as to be of service to others and to encourage the development of, the, of a growing, compassionate wisdom culture that can solve the problems of today. And may we all begin to taste the experience of enlightenment so that we can share and lead all beings to that state.
the mind of enlightenment, we use the word bodhicitta. And so we usually end our meditations, may, may the precious bodhicitta arise and grow. And though it has arisen, may it not decline, but increase forevermore. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to make it too long, but mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I, you know, if I'm lying in bed, sometimes I find this really helpful, especially if I'm just like all over the place, you know. You start, you know, bringing in the herbs and the water and, you know, and Padampa Zange said that just this can take you to enlightenment, which, I mean, I think I'd want to add a bit of tonglen here and there, but yeah. So um, I think we'll take a little break, maybe a 15 minute break and then come back and, uh, and you know, maybe I'll talk a little bit about your devotion, but we can also answer questions. And I'm just here to do it, you know, if you want, just tell me what you want. And we'll do it. I'm glad it was, I never, you know, I hope it was good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Don't wait for me. Just go ahead. I'm going to sit here and drink my water. The rest of us. So we just have a little bit of time left, and it's always good to remember our motivation. And um, I also wanted to share this with you guys. Um. Because, I mean, some of you are more advanced practitioners, and one of the things that Lama Zopa Rinpoche uh, used to do was to chant this prayer, calling the guru from afar. And um, one of the things that he asked me to do and encouraged me to do was to take these Tibetan chants and put them so we can chant them in English. And um, a friend of mine... Um, created a website for me a few years ago. I, I don't know if you told anybody, but it's called Brave, Brave as in Brave, and View as in Long Distance, BraveView.org. And a lot of the stuff is on there if you're interested in, if you like chanting or singing, um, then you can find stuff there. Do you have different chanting? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, not, yeah. Um. So I'm not sure how well I can sing today, but what? No, no, I can do it. That's okay. I mean, I know the tips. I don't know the tune. Well, I don't know. I'm gonna sing. I haven't tried singing for a while, so we'll just see. But I know the tune. I mean, it's not that I don't know it. So it's just how well my voice is. So um, that's a, yeah. Oh. I thought you were leaving. Well, I left my purse here. Oh, That's oh yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm glad I'm anywhere. I was only a few minutes away. Yeah. In that home. Oh, that's really good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye, Margaret. Bye, bye. Yeah. Careful. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and the first time I heard um, Lama Zopramache chant this, I was actually at um, a friend Karuna's in Pam's house in Kathmandu, and um, he just, we were having dinner and he just decided to show us how to do this. And um, I think it, he hadn't really done it before and I was always enchanted by it. And so eventually we got the text for it. And um, so now, but so I think let's just pause for a moment and um, remember our motivation, our refuge. And particularly now that um, Amazopra Mache isn't here in person. I also find this equally is for me anyway to ask him to come back. Mm -hmm. So um, I didn't, you know, one of the things before we chanted that I find that I found fascinating about um, studying neuroscience is that um, in order for people to heal. Um, traumas, which we all have, it doesn't, doesn't matter the degree, is that they need to uh, feel safe and they need to feel um, connected and also that 
um, they have a way of sharing their misfortune. And I and I uh, began to realize that that is the function of guru yoga, but it's not explained explicitly like that. I mean, if you read the Lam Rim, you get eight reasons why it's good, like you won't go to hell and you have the Dharma in the future and, you you know, you, you know, which is all well and good. But I mean, I'm looking for relevance to the, to contemporary society. And so I find, and, and it's just from what happened to me in retreats that, you know, the more I would take time taking refuge and like we did and feeling the presence of the guru and, you know, telling the guru, I'm suffering. I have this problem. I have that problem. Like you're talking to somebody and please help me. And, you know, instead we're so formal in our practice, you know, or formal in our responses to questions. And we all want to do everything by the book. And this is why I love Lama, Z Lama Yeshi so much, because he's like, don't do it, you know, learn the book, but then make it, once you've learned it, make it real for you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I don't think, well, but what I discovered and what I believe now is that if we really take refuge and we really call the guru, it can be a deeply healing experience because um, like we, Lama wrote that book or had made that, they made that book of Lama's talk about becoming our therapist. And this is how we can be our own therapist is the guru listens. We can tell the guru and the guru will respond to us when we visualize you know, the light rays coming in, if we really have faith, this is love, this is healing energy coming into me, rather than just following a formula on a piece of paper, Sangi Chodan, Sogi Chodan, La Dan, boom, I'm moving on to the next one, you know, that doesn't do very much for me, you know, and so, if, if, and so the thing is, when you do that, then you feel protected, you feel loved, and when you really make a heart connection and especially knowing that that's healing you and that you're connecting with your, that the guru is, is an external being, but the guru is also your inner, this is what Lam Yeshi told us all, is your inner light. And so it's very difficult to connect with our inner light because we have so many blocks. But when we put it outside of ourselves and we know we've experienced the blessing of the guru, we experienced the power of his holiness, the Dalai Lama, and we can... Um, you know, remember that and go back to that and generate that, you know, work with it, then um, taking refuge can be a really, really powerful experience. And and then when we then, the next step, you know, in all our practices is generating bodhicitta. So what did I just say? You know, what it is we need to feel safe and protected and loved, but we also re need to feel connected. So then we start connecting with our parents and all sentient beings. And if you really do it with, like feeling and real, not just words, then then that's how we can heal ourselves. And I'm, I, I believe that's how Dharma works. And if you don't engage with it on that level, you know, you can learn a lot of nice things and repeat them all, but I don't know how much change you're going to find. You know? And so then you'll go, oh, Buddhism doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And it's because we haven't been taught how to make it really work for us. Mm -hmm. So... When I work with somebody, I use yeah. it silently. Yeah. And I use Chief as, as my guru. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Beloved Chief, for yeah. your presence. Yeah. In your likeness, I recognize myself. Perfect. Yeah. That, and that comes into my heart. Yeah. And that goes. Yeah. Well, it's universal, isn't it? Time. And that's the other thing. I mean, human beings since beginningless time have taken refuge in something. Right. Whether it's the sun or the moon yeah. goddess or the, yeah. you know, but it's a thing that we need to be healthy human beings. And in our modern contemporary society, when we throw out Christianity, we throw out everything. Mm -hmm. And that's a mistake. You know, I mean, maybe we didn't like the politics mm -hmm. of the church, mm -hmm. you know, but human beings have an organic, natural need to be connected and to be connected to universal love you know yeah. and so whether it's a guru or jesus or the moon goddess or you know whatever it is you know mm -hmm. and and so and 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 so because i have that connection with the tibetans this particular prayer mm -hmm. is very meaningful to me mm -hmm. and so um are you familiar with this uh, filmmaker john bush b-u-s-h bush, bush. no 
he makes the most beautiful um, documentaries about Tibetan Buddhism oh. in Tibet with oh. the monks. Oh, I should look it up. John Bush, Bush, like George Bush, only John Bush. Okay, great. So, so with that in mind, let's do this. And you can add more things to it. You know, I mean, you don't have to stick to this. You can say what you want, what you need. And then it's important to stop and feel that feeling. And then, like I said before, and then rest in that space where you turn your awareness from the outside to the inside. So it goes like this. Lama Ken Lama Ken Lama Ken Glorious Blue. It's the same tune over and over again. So once you get it the first time, you'll be able to rest. Glorious Blue. Should I go lower? Glorious Guru, casting ignorance. Glorious Guru, revealing the path. Glorious Guru, bring from Samsara. Glorious Guru, see, see, by poison. Glorious Guru, which grant each I beseech you, please grant me blessings. Glorious Guru, Please bless me to recall death and impermanence from my heart. Glorious Guru, please bless me to have the thought of no need in my mind. Glorious Guru, please bless me to abide in wilderness focus on my Practice glorious Lord. Please bless me not to have any hindrance to practice glorious Lord. Please bless me so all bad conditions of eternity. Glorious Lord, please bless me to complete the two works of self and others. Glorious Guru, please bless me now soon. Please bless me soon, very soon. 
Please bless me as I listen on my portion. Please bless me in this very session. May you just recite, may I not arise here, Rimshay out of this. May I not arise here even for a second in the actions of the glorious Guru. May I regard whatever actions are done as a With this devotion, may I receive the blessings of the Guru in my heart. Magnificent and precious root Guru, please abide on the lotus seat at my heart. Guide me with your great kindness and grant me the realizations of your holy body speech in your life. And then you just imagine that, you know, the Guru comes in and results in your heart. It's like that. Yeah, so I just thought to share that and because sometimes people like something to sing and chant. And, mm -hmm. and I also have to make one more comment too because, you know, we're in this dicey business time of the Tibetans have their culture and their way and how is that going to fit in our lives and what's meaningful for us. And um, that was one of the main reasons I decided to do long retreats is because I felt like um, you know, we can't make Western Dharma until people, Western people have realizations because otherwise we will just make up stuff and it's kind of the way it is now, actually. <laughs> A lot of places, you know, things are not quite, anyway, I don't, I won't, I won't comment, but, um, but this thing about guru devotion, I think is one of the stickiest areas because this, but it says here, may I not arise heresy even for a second in the actions of the glorious guru. Now, what this is, in my mind, and this is just my opinion, is that this is where the culture clash is. Because for Lama Zopa Rinpoche, it wouldn't matter what a guru would do, and he would see him as a Buddha, as far as I can understand from what I've seen. I, I've never asked him that. But, you know, if there's a guru that appears to be sexually abusing people, Rinpoche will take the traditional view which is that that was the right thing for that person, you know, or, and he will not, con this has happened recently at PMT, he will not condemn the teacher. And I've had this with other Western teachers where I won't mention any names, but people have come and been beaten or hit by a Western teacher. And Rinpoche says, this is your guru. Mm -hmm. Now, in our mm -hmm. society, that's just not going to float. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like we have to make some kind of compensation, and that's what he has, to deal with this difference, because that's just not going to work here. You know, if someone's, and so there are other gurus, not Lama Zopa Rinpoche, but very highly respected lamas that I received teachings from that say what I said a few hours ago, which is that it's really important to check the teacher out. And of course, Lama Zopa Rinpoche would say that too. You know, you don't, See, you don't just take anybody and see that it's someone you've been around for a long time and you really have faith in them that they are the Buddha. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult for us to do because we're not around our teachers that much. Mm -hmm. And so more contemporary teachers, because Lama Zopra Mache, unlike Lama Yeshi, was very, very traditional. And he was very much into preserving the Mahayana tradition just as it came out of Tibet. Mm -hmm. And with some you know some i mean he does like women you know mm -hmm. so um but what other teachers have said is what i said to you is that you know if you've had a really good teacher and you see something not so right about it you can still respect that teacher but you don't have to continue to be that teacher student now i'm not sure lama zopa would go with that so i just needed to say that because this thing of man not rise heresy towards the glue of even a second that's how people end up being abused. And I just, I just want to, I mean, that's one of the reasons I wanted to pick this subject because I think it's something we need to talk about within the FBMT. How are we going to deal with this? 
And we can't just pretend it isn't there because it is there, you know, and it's Western teachers and Tibetan teachers. And, um, and I know, I don't know how much of you people know about, but there was a very, very famous, wonderful Lama, Sogyo Rinpoche. And all this stuff came up about him about, what, four or five years ago. And, you know, he died after that. And at, one of, at the light of the path, maybe the last one, maybe you were there. Lama Zopa, this, he said, I mean, and I actually agree with him. And he said, this is our karma of being in the degenerate times. That they may be Buddhist, but because of our karma, we don't have the capacity to receive it that way. And I think a lot of people get very upset with that, but I believe that. And he even said, you people should be glad you have a teacher at all. It's such degenerate times, mm -hmm. you know, and if he ends up sleeping with somebody, you know, and Sogya wasn't a monk. You know, he wasn't a monk. So it's not like he was out of bounds or anything. So it's really something that we need to work with. And because, especially when you start taking tantric teachings, the relationship with the guru is very important. And what I was just saying before about the healing capacity of that. Can you imagine if you've done that and then you feel betrayed by your guru? That's a terrible, that's worse than child abuse. You know, that's for an adult. It's a very terrible thing to go through. And I know people that have, you know, they've walked away from the Tibetan system. So I don't have any answers about it, but I think it's something that we need to consider and we need to think about, especially if we're engaging in these practices, you know, and this is a small group of people, and I don't know you very well, but maybe it's better it's a small group of people. And so, because guru devotion has transformed my life, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it is, they say, and when you do the Kagyu lineage prayer, it's the head of the practice. It's the most important thing in the practice, because it's what guides you, you know, and it, it's, it helps you get your intuition and to be able to discern, you know, this is the right, this is wrong, you know, and to heal yourself. So, but there it's, and they say it's the most, it's very dangerous. You know, they say and getting involved with the guru is like being, uh, you know, those Chinese, what do they call finger things you get stuck yeah, in? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, you can't, you know, there's only, you can only go up once you're inside one of those things, you know, or down, you know, so. Can you be a, a devout a Buddhist without having a yeah, you devotion can. to the guru? Yeah, you can. You can. But I think that your experience will be less deep. You know, it's like going to church and not praying to Jesus, you know. And um, and I think that also what's, what's happening in the West is because of our um, our culture, we are very well versed in education and intellect. And so I'm watching the Dharma come in in that milieu. You know, and I'm seeing that the FBT master's program, you know, yeah. uh, the what are the basic program, you know. And what we got in the beginning 40 years ago was more about the heart and communicating from the heart. And it's all about Lama's whole thing. Lama's whole thing was experience. He wanted us to experience enlightenment, get a taste of enlightenment. You know, that doesn't come through your head. It's the path of compassion. Yeah, it's the path of compassion. And so the guru opens that door. And so um, I think we have to be really careful as the Dharma comes into the West that it goes to the universities and it becomes another discipline that you get a PhD and suddenly you're a Buddha, you're a Dharma teacher. And you could yeah. be like totally nothing. You don't have anything in your heart, you know? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, not so long ago, there was something in the news about the Dalai, uh, Dalai Lama and that tried to do Shinya here. Oh yeah, and they, they really did. did. It, it was the Chinese. I'm sorry. I don't mean to, yes. but, it, but you know, and it's not the Chinese people. It's the communist government. Mm -hmm. They will do anything they can to smear the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. And so that's all it was. They just, the same way, uh, do you remember? I can't remember his name now. There were in the I can't remember. It was like some presidential race. There was a, a the doctor, the governor of Vermont was learning, was running running for president in like the Hart. Iowa caucus. Gary Hart. Was it Gary no, no, Hart? it wasn't Gary Hart. It was that one. No, that was different. This was the doctor from Vermont. And like he like he screamed or something during one of the 
things and they reported it and they made it bigger and worse oh, and no. and they made it so they bad that he it? what what they isolated yeah and they made it and they put it on the news it was on fox news and all that mm -hmm. stuff he had to stop he had to back down. What was his name? And he became the head of the Democratic Party, but he was a contender to the Democratic Convention in 2000 or something like that. What was his name? Mm -hmm. But I lived in Vermont. He was governor. He's a really good guy. Vermont has universal health care. Everybody there is free health care. And um, he was a doctor. And so that's what they did with the Dalai Lama. They just took one little thing and blew it up. You know, and so I say what you told me about about Rinpoche taking on the obstacles? Yeah, because Lama Zopa said to Jackie that the highest practice is to die for the guru. And if I can say this without crying, I'm not sure I can. Yeah. But Lama Zopa passed right at that time. And a lot of people said that Lama Zopa took on all those obstacles so that it would stop. Yeah. And I, I, and I mean, a great bodhisattva doesn't stop at anything. And there's no doubt that Lama Zopa Rinpoche is a great bodhisattva, Buddha, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're so rare, which is why His Holiness is wanting to help us all, you know? Because he really, really loved Rinpoche, mm -hmm. as we all did and do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but that's what happened. But I've known people um, contemporary who have seen a video of Lama Yeshe or a video now of Rinpoche, and they know right then and there that that's their teacher, mm -hmm. even though they've never met them, but yeah. they just know. They yeah. missed the boat when the Jigwe Lama Yeshe was alive. There's a number of people who say, that's my new teacher. Oh, yeah, me too. I just never got to meet him in this yeah. life. Yeah. 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 I mean, a lot of people come to FDMT because they've seen Lama Yeshe's videos. You know, I'm like, wow, that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how do we know when one of these um, llamas uh, come back? How do you know? Oh, that? that's a whole big story. <laughs> Actually, there's a really good film that's on YouTube now. It's called The Reincarnation. When Jeff's Jeff came back down too. It's, he, it's on Vimeo. It's better on Vimeo, but I don't know what that it is, but it's called the reincarnation of Kenchen, K H E N C H E N, Kenchen Rinpoche. And it's the story of going into Tibet and finding this young Lama who was the reincarnation of Ken, Ken, Pema, something, Pema, Pema Gelsen, who was one of the great Lamas who came out of Tibet, Kenzo Pema Gelsen. But there's also Martin Scorsese's film called Kundun. It's about finding the Dalai Lama. Yeah, and so what happens is um, sometimes lamas like the Karmapa, you know, leave signs or messages. And what they do is another thing in Tibetan Buddhism, they do divinations. You know, they and they have they also have an oracle. There's also a film called The Oracle, mm -hmm. where a spirit will enter into um, a monk's body or or a nun or a lay woman. And say, you know, well, look in this part of the world, you know. And so they kind of have an idea maybe what part of the world is. And they go and they go searching for little kids. And like in the case of, Par of um, Kenzo Pema Geltsin, when Par Kenzo and Bache saw him, he ran, he ran up to him and said, oh, I've been waiting for you. He was like three years old. You know, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. It's like that, you know. The book on Boy Lama, too, but what? Vicki McKenzie. Yeah. And she has another book called Reincarnation that's about many stories like that. And yeah, and also was the same. I mean, Lama Sopa met him when he was really tiny in, in Spain and said, This is him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so did his mom, but she didn't tell anybody. Maria had dreams, too. Yeah. Yeah, so. It's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It is. And then it's, sometimes it goes further. Well, I was actually there when his home was recognized, Lama Oso. So they put out a bunch of malas that uh, one, one will have been the mala of the previous Lama, but there'll be other malas, some of them more beautiful. And they'll, the, the child will then be offered a selection of malas. 
and generally if it's the reincarnation, even though there may be one that's more beautiful, he'll recognize the one that was his mm -hmm. or yeah. a cup that he used to drink out. So, a few things they'll do that with yeah. gorges and bells. And I heard that when Osel picked up his mall, he went like this. <laughs> <Where is everybody? laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean I I had interactions with Osel when he was really little that made me know he was on the issue. I mean he told me things that only I had had in private mm -hmm. with on the issue. So I have no like, doubt. Yes, yeah, so you would be yeah. 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 And um, my partner now, Jeff Jukes, um, he made that he made that film. But so this Tara Kenton Rinpoche now is back and but when he when because Jeff knew the previous one, and when he, this is a good story too, when he went to meet the little four-year-old boy or three-year-old boy or something. They introduced him as Jeff Jukes and, they, and he said, that's not Jeff Jukes, that's 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 Pema Kelsan. And that was the name that the previous Lama had given him. So these are very special beings, which is why you asked me about a guru, you know. Yeah. These are the gurus that we want to know, if we can. You know? These beings. You know? They're really special are there beings. very many alive today? Yeah, there are. Yeah, and um, there are. And, you know, hopefully Jackie will be one too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rebecca, are you? You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I think that's what inspired me to do retreat was like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if a Western person could do this? Because they teach us in Tantra how to die, how to die with awareness and how to go through the intermediate state with awareness and how to take rebirth. So it's not a mystery. It's like, that's what it shocked me so much when I first started studying this. I said, because I'd studied biology, I said, this is just as real as the Krebs cycle. You know, this is how our cells work. I mean, they're presenting this like it's just, this is what you do. But the hard part is you have to do it with your subtle mind. And for us to access our subtle mind is more difficult because we're all so freaked out, you know, from our but they call it moon, you know, wind disease. We all have wind disease. Mm -hmm. Not everybody, but most people do. And it's it takes a lot to get into that calm state. Whereas they not not for them because they've been doing it for lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And also Tibetan culture is, is a little kinder now. Children are treated like special beings when they're born, not like this person I'm going to punish to make them be how I want them to be. I mean, it's different now in the West, but most of us are raised like that. You know? So, so is that child then like isolated and taught? And he's not isolated, but he or she is is um is is raised in a very well. It's kind of difficult because they are often taken away from their parents. I think so. And so it'd be, I think, in the it'd be good if their parents could come with them. And I know also his father went with him to the monastery, but they're they are given um you know they start their education really young. And I know in uh, Trujo Rinpoche's case, they recited the Sanskrit and Tibetan alphabet to him once, and he could recite it right away when he was three years old. So it's what we call a prodigy. I mean, I'm sure Mozart was some kind of reincarnated some musician, you know. Yeah. Does uh, having an air burial have any bearing on how we're reincarnated? No. Okay. No, because it all happens by the time by the time you leave your body, you're already in the next producing your next body. Really? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons the Tibetans, uh, they leave bodies. If you've died, they leave you for three days. And some lamas, like Ling Rinpoche, there's a new Ling Rinpoche now, but the previous Ling Rinpoche, um, sat in meditation with what would be clinically called a dead body for two weeks in the summertime in India. And his body never smelled. His body never went off. It smelled like flowers. His nails and everything continued to grow. And his grow. nails continued to grow. But if you brought a Western doctor there, he was dead. Mm -hmm. And so, you see, these subtle winds that I'm telling you about, they all enter into your heart chakra at the time of death. And this is all the stuff you learn when you study Tantra, mm -hmm. which is why you need a guru. Mm -hmm. So they all, and, and then, um, and then that leaves the kind of your head. And it, it's just this, it, it's not even... I mean, it doesn't really have any substance. It's just a subtle mind and body. Mm -hmm. And then that goes into the intermediate state and mm -hmm. has an intermediate state body. 
But these high lamas, they have awareness throughout this whole process. Mm -hmm. And then they can, because they've done these tantric practices, they can visualize, in, you know, the next, you know, because they have this thing, you know, when you do the tantric practice, it's like you go through the death process, then you have this little tiny little thing, you know, like a hum or a nada or something that moves. And then you look down and it's a, a symbol of the sperm and the, and the ovum of the next parents. And you dive into that. And then you come up and you create your body. And they, the Tibetans, long before Western uh, medicine, they had like all the stages of embryo, embryonic development. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and then they'll come back and sometimes they'll just say, um, this person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a little girl in Scotland who was, who's like that. And she came back and, and she started just going, going finding closets and sitting and meditating in them and she told her dad she went up to a picture and said that's me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah it's a whole mm -hmm. like other realm that our science hasn't yet touched mm -hmm. and i'm fascinated by it and as a person who was trained in science i was like wow this is the most amazing thing you know we need to know about this and that's why the dalai lama is so interested in science because he wants it he wants it to become scientific. And he did say a long time ago, he said he believes that in his lifetime, they will develop a machine to to recognize the subtle mind. Well, may I? Yeah. I'm talking color light therapy. Yeah. Uh, color, what kind of therapy? Color. Color, 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 color light color therapy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you probably uh, like that meditation. It's from Germany. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my teacher, he already knew how to devise a, a treatment prenatal because he understood that there is a presence, yeah. a consciousness before yeah. it goes into yeah. the egg and yeah. Uh, yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. So he had this download somehow. He yeah, well, he's, I mean, Tibetans don't have the corner on the market. It's just that they, they seem to know more about it and have celebrated it and kept it alive all these years but it can happen by chance or by karma or you know i mean i think there's probably a lot of tulkus running around the place you know yeah. i mean they don't necessarily have to be buddhists what is a tulku a tulku is a, a reincarnated it just means a reincarnation yeah. so well maybe we should wrap up yes. and uh and make another dedication um do we want to read some dedications from the prayer book? Yeah. Not a bad idea, is it? We often do Shanti Devas. Okay, great. Well, maybe, do you want to lead them, Rebecca? My voice is kind of tired. Do you want to, like, do what you guys always do? Um, or maybe, would you, would you we like to? Would you like to, Nicole, maybe read the dedication prayers? Yes, whatever you want. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um, we have your book. Yeah. I do, what is it, 244? Two, or to um, Shanti Davis, what? Yeah. Shanti uh, Davis, 246. Yeah. Okay. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain the ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of our merits. May all the living creatures suffer, may no one be overcome. May no one be afraid or belittled with the mind weighed down by depression. May the bodies be formed, may their May those whose bodies are warm with toil be restored and find repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill completely be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the fright to cease to be afraid, and those bound be free. May the powerless find power. May people think of them and each other. 
for as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then the United Two remain to this fellow virtues of the world. Minus the Dalai Lama. Yeah, please switch the journey. 244. Yeah, we'll do it. Shall we go first? Yep. Yeah. And the land and the circle of us. Two of the networks all having this with a all powerful generating sentence. Yeah, so please remain until Samsara ends. Can we do the short one for Osel Gita? Yes, on 245. Yeah. Venerable one, to you whose time succeeds that all the wanderers, for those wanderers in far places as the gender was, mind of everybody concerned for us, potentially descending again into a family of large distant land. You may make this request, please be seated. 234. Fearless teacher assembly all the objects of refuge in the lands. Please bestow the virtue and goodness of the calm she has spread in spreading the moon expression of complete teachings. The soul gave way through which all benefit and happiness emerged, and her mother living beings, some of them in the heart of peace, what a great loss. Nevertheless, through the undeceiving truth of the blessing of the ocean for the beauty of the and the great waves of the Chia, Chil Chilton, and what were it? And the smile of the great incarnation, so it would be in glory and proportion to silence. And what about the next page? 235. Yep. Through the merits of these virtuous, virtuous actions, and they go all the beings without exception into the enlightened state. May the supreme angel of Bodhisattva that is not a risk for our eyes to the problem. And may that just as it is not done, but it increases more and more. Just as the very much is not about the two who realize the things they are. I too take all these merits in that best way, way that I can follow the perfect example. And then we always pray for world peace and for solving climate crisis and for all the Dharma centers to flourish and for um, all practitioners have all the conditions they need to be able to be supported in their practice. And also, I always dedicate that all the organizations around the world, doesn't matter what they are, but the ones that are sincerely working to alleviate the suffering of the world and create a better culture, may they also have all the conditions that they need. And then we um, dedicate re recognizing how everything's interdependence. We're all interconnected. And that um, although I appear to be existing from my own side, I, I arise in dependence upon my mind and my body, and that I'm not truly existent, and neither is you, and neither is anything else. Mm -hmm. And so even the, the merit that we dedicate is a dependent arising. And then Rinpoche always ended with rejoicing. How wonderful it is that we get to be together and share, and I get to meet you and see my friends again and make new friends. and. And um, I just wish you all the best and thank you for the opportunity. And thanks to Jackie, she drove in the rain for two hours yesterday and picked me up and she's gonna take me back tomorrow. And Jackie's not got that most serviceable body anymore. So I really appreciate that she's done. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, so yeah, a long awesome. life with you, Paula and Jackie and all of yeah. you. Quit listening. Yes, and uh, on behalf of, of your